we go back to the office, the captain uh, comes up and says, We got a name. What do you mean we got a name? He says, San Francisco came up with the name Richard Ramirez. If we had a name, we could match that to that single print off the rearview mirror of that car used down in Orange County. They came up with eight Richard Ramirez's. And that print was manually compared against various Richard Ramirez prints. One of which matched the fingerprint. He had a lightweight criminal record, some petty thievery, grand theft auto, but nothing of any violence whatsoever. They also found that they had a booking photo of him. On Friday, August 30th, we took that booking photo, took it over to the informant. The informant looked and said, that's him. And that's when they identified the Richard Ramirez, who was, in fact, the Night Stalker. We had a name. We had an identification. We had a picture. We knew what area he hung out in, and things were falling into place. By this time, we had a warrant for Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, for the murder of Peter Pan, for the attempted murder of his wife. My chief made it perfectly clear that we were proceeding with alerting everybody in the community who Richard Ramirez was. We said, please, give us 24 hours, we'll have him. We'll have this SOB in custody. Sit on a murder warrant? We've identified this vicious killer? I said, can you imagine what the media would do to us if they found out, and they will find out, that we were in possession of a murder warrant and we sat on it and somebody else is killed this weekend? I said, we'd have blood on our hands. I could understand why they thought it was wrong, but we thought if he finds out he's wanted, then the chase is on and it'll be more difficult to find it. 10 o'clock news, 11 o'clock news, Los Angeles, San Francisco, we're going with a media blitz. Yeah, we were pissed. Uh, there are no two ways about it because we wanted a shot at this guy. We are satisfied that we now have the identity the, of the Night Stalker. A man by the name of Richard, Richard Ramirez. Ramirez. This photograph was taken about eight months ago and right here in Los Angeles. There he is. There is the face. We still didn't know where Richard Ramirez was, but we had a picture and a name. We were looking for him to leave Los Angeles once this information came out. Our information at that point was that Richard Ramirez used the Greyhound bus depot. They used it to travel in and out. He had a locker there. We requested that LAPD's SIS team handle the surveillance. To be quite frank with you, they had a history. They uh, generally followed felons that committed violent crimes, and when confronted, a lot of times there was a, an officer-involved shooting and, and the felon uh, was killed. If he was going to go down, he wanted to go down the hard way. I was hoping that if he pulled a gun that he'd be dead, the problem's over with. But the other side of me wanted to get to know the man, wanted to spend time and interview him. I'd spent an awful lot of time in this case, and I wanted the opportunity to talk to him. So we set up the surveillance there around the Greyhound bus depot. And what happens is Ramirez is out of town. He's actually in Arizona. He wanted to go there to visit a brother. So on Friday evening, he left Arizona to come back to LA. We're looking for Richard to come in from the outside. Richard came inside through the back door through where passengers enter. He recognized cops right away because cops wear ugly clothing, wear dirty clothing, but their teeth are clean. They don't smell bad and their hair is clean. So he walks out the exit out onto the street, walks down the block, and he goes into a liquor store, and on the front page of every newspaper is his picture. Yeah, you look at the, the picture of the newspaper. You look at, he looks uh, really scared, you know. He sees that and he panics. Walked out of there real quick, got on a bus, and the bus went down Olympic. All he had to do was make it eight miles East Los Angeles, and he had a brother living there. He saw some passenger in the bus had a morning paper looking at it, and then looked over at him, and his eyes got big, put the newspaper down, and pulled a cork. There happened to be a phone booth right there, and Richard could see him dialing right away. Mirrors knew he had been made. People are starting to turn around and look and point and talk. It's him, it's him. 
So he jumps off the bus. And what he didn't know was the gentleman that phoned in had flagged down a truck from the gas company and said, hey, killer's on that bus, follow that bus. And the chase was on. He's being tracked by people calling in. He runs into the I-5 freeway. And ran across all lanes of the freeway. He then continued running in the northeast direction, ending up on Indiana, and he tried to carjack one gentleman. Fausto Pignon wrestled with Ramirez as the suspect tried to steal his car. And then the guy by the neck, then we strive up back and forth enough for the car. Couldn't get the car out. And when he couldn't do that, he ran across the street. Then turned right on Hubbard Street. Yeah, I'm in the Give me the keys, give me the keys. And then I looked up at his face and I saw his eyes, and then I recognized that he was the one who killed. In Spanish, he hollered to give him the keys or he would kill me. That's when Manuel de la Torre got involved. Manuel ran out front. He got a metal stick from, the, from right there from the gate, hit him in the head. I gave him one by the car, the man fell. He started running away. I chased him and I gave him another hit. All the neighbors chased him down the street. You know, I say, oh my God, that's the guy. The guy with the bar was telling his wife to go get a gun so he could shoot me. I didn't give a fuck at that point because I was so fucking tired. I, I looked down the street and I saw uh, Sheriff's patrol car coming down the street. Call came out. 22, 415, possible fight, possible man with a gun. I could see maybe three or four people on one side of the street. The closer I got, I could see they were moving around, they were yelling, they were waving around, screaming, and I could see one person sitting on the sidewalk. He said something in Spanish about, uh, I'm lucky the cops are coming or something, because he knew that we were gonna, everybody was gonna finish. All the neighbors just hung together and got him. There's one guy holding him at bay with this metal bar. I could tell that he had been hit. The crowd had detained him, had beat him. He had blood out on his head, on his hands, on his shirt. He was tired of running. He was really exhausted. I just told him, stand up. He stood up. I handcuffed him. I put him in the police car in the back seat. And takes him into custody. They were starting to circle, getting closer and closer, and pointing to a newspaper. And I could even hear people saying, ese es el matón, the killer. Let's get him. Yeah, let's get him. And I'm like, oh, no. I got to control this. I was just really pissed off at the way things had turned out, that I was under arrest now. And I turned at all the people that are around me, and I spit at them. I poked my tongue out at them. I stuck it in and out, you know, like a serpent. If I would have had a pistol, I would have made them scatter. They wouldn't be as brave as they thought they were. You ever been arrested before? Huh? Danny, what, where's your car? Never been, what's your name? Huh? What's your name? I love it. I get notified. They've got him in custody. I am so excited. I can't wait to get there. And we hauled. I mean, we were we were flying. And when I got to Hollenbeck Station, a lot of people around the station. The entire Hollenbeck Police Station was surrounded with citizens. I was working at the crime lab. We received a call needing someone to go over to LAPD to fingerprint and positively identify a suspect that they believed to be the killer. And I remember when he walked through the door, he was tall and slender. He had these dark eyes. And he just slowly looked around the room to take it in. And he looked right, right in your eyes. You know, he did look at you. And that's when I saw, wow, those eyes are terrible. There's evil in that man. And you could sense it. My partner, Hannah Woods, jumped up and she said, I will print him. Because she, she knew I didn't want to do it. We went into an interview room, and he was sitting there. He was just like the witnesses had been talking about. The hair, the teeth, the way he talked. I said, my name's Sergeant Frank Salerno, and I started to introduce Gil. And he said, I know who you are. <laughs> it sort of took me back, because I never had a, a suspect say that on an interview involving a murder. He knew all about Frank Salerno to the point where he was calling him Mr. Salerno and he called him that because he knew Mr. Salerno had worked on the Hillside Strangler. He was like awestruck, you know, that was, a, that was a hero to him. And I was just another Mexican in the crowd. He did admit to reading about various cases. He read about the Hillside Strangler, read about Bundy. He was a student. And then 
I started talking to Richard. I was from the streets. I'm Hispanic. I know he was from the streets. And we talked, a little slang talk. Ah, orale, what's going on, Rich? You know, orale is a greeting of saying, hello, what's up? Nobody else would be saying that other than somebody that came from the streets that's Hispanic. There was one point in time I got frightened. I'm talking to him and getting to part of the interview and I'm getting to a very sensitive area. Well, I'm talking to him about his family. He's got his head down on the table and his hands are right there just like this. He's just like listening to me, but he's, and all of a sudden he starts to breathe heavy, almost to the point of hyperventilation. And as he's doing this, his hands start coming off the table for a little bit. And in my mind for the millisecond, I'm sitting there saying, if this guy starts to float around this room, I'm out of here. Or I've been stabbed, I've been shot at, but I ain't never fought nobody that's floating around a room. And I'm just, this guy's gonna levitate right here and scare the bejesus out of me. We go outside, and Hollenbeck looked like a zoo. There was a crowd around there. I got the impression it's a lynch mob. They had gotten word somebody's out there gonna kill him when he comes out, shoot up the place. Stay back, stay back, stay back. Salerno was riding in the back seat with Richard, and I was in the front seat, and we only had to go a few miles, so we got to Men's Central Jail. We drove down the street, we turned right, and there was a truck, and there was some lady standing on top of there. As we came by, she opened up her blouse, and she's swinging her breast back and forth. She wasn't doing it for me. I said, there you go, Rich. She's doing it for you. We had helicopters overhead. We had police vehicles and motorcycles in front, police vehicles and motorcycles behind us, all along the streets. I mean, it was like a motorcade. They were just chanting, jumping up and down, screaming. They were happy. And there was hundreds of people, and everybody was just yelling. It was like, we won the World Series. We were in McDonald's with the kids. Every single person in that restaurant was clapping and like, you know, cheering. I mean, everybody. And they said, they caught the Night Stalker, and we we just shouted. We were so thrilled. We are happy to announce that the individual we have in custody is Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker. Richard Ramirez arrested today after being held by an angry Los crowd. Angeles police today arrested the man they believe is the so-called Night Stalker. With a man who may be the Night Stalker in custody. I am so proud of them. I, I can't begin to tell you how proud we, all of us, are the people in this community. He's the suspect we'll be looking for. So uh, now comes all the work of tying him in to all of the other crimes that we're looking at. Once we got to the jail, I told him, we're gonna put you in a special cell. I said, we're gonna put you in the same cell as a hillside strangler, Kenneth Bianchi. You could see that he was taken with that. And Richard just got all jazzed. He was excited. We were playing a card. We knew he was interested in, in serial killings. This was like a celebrity cell. Who's to say at some point he wasn't going to tell a jailer, hey, tell those homicide cops to come back. I want to talk to him. And that's where we left him. We left him in, in Kenneth Bianchi's old cell at, at Central Jail. About 8 o'clock, 8.30 that night, I'm done, I get out. That particular day, a cousin of mine was getting married. I go to the Hilton, I'm walking in from the outside into the lobby of the place, and I see one of my younger sisters, and she's not really that affectionate with me. She runs up, she puts her arm, interlocks it with mine. She says, oh, come on, I want to walk in with you. I said, why do you want to walk in with me? She says, oh, you're the talk of the town tonight. And I could uh, hear people saying, that's him, there he is. Yeah, that's him. And they're looking. And all I care about is looking for my family. And I see my mom, and I see my sisters, and they come and run up, and everybody's hugging, and they all start crying. Subsequent to the arrest of Ramirez, we set up a lineup. They brought a six-year-old surviving victim. For six years old, she was just unbelievable. She sat uh, in the audience of potential witnesses. I think once I knew that he couldn't see me, I didn't have any fear about it. I said, now, is there anybody that has any questions? Her little hand went up. Was, what is it, sweetheart? She says, do I write the word to or the number to? Ramirez will be arraigned for murder later this week. Prosecutors say they intend to ask for the death penalty. There was a prosecutor assigned. It was Phil Halpin. I was second chair. 
What I really remember is the drama in court. Not since the days of Charlie Manson did you have the circus thing going on in court. First of all, you had Ramirez who was playing up to the crowd, and then Daniel and Arturo Hernandez came in to handle the case, and that's when the circus really started. We've only been in practice for, you know, two years. We had six murder cases under a belt, no death penalty cases. We get a call from his parents' lawyers in El Paso that happened to be people that I knew because I grew up in El Paso and I went to University of Texas at El Paso and most of my friends became lawyers. Calls comes in and uh, they're on speakerphone. So I hear the voice, uh, Senor Hernandez, uh, licenciado, soy Ricardo Ramirez, el papá de Richard. Nos puede ayudar. So we talked and says, let's do it. One of the problems that we encountered is that we were looked upon like not capable, they're not qualified. These guys had never had a case of this magnitude. There's a difference in defending somebody for petty theft or burglary than there is for multiple murders, a death penalty case, let alone one that involved, you know, 13, 14 victims. We were always concerned about a mistrial. We didn't know if the defense attorneys were going to be able to make it through the case. Mr. Kelton is going to continue with his childish acting through the court in front of the cameras. I would have to take him outside and teach him a lesson. Just a minute. October 24th, 1985, Richard Ramirez stuns a packed courtroom. The man accused of 14 murders that terrorized California holds up his palm for the world to see. There is a five-pointed star enclosed in a circle, a pentagram. To some, it is the mark of the devil. Then, after pleading not guilty to all the charges, court was recessed, but Ramirez had the last word. I am sure that generations and generations from now, the image of his palm with the pentagram and the sound of his voice saying, Hail Satan, he'll be there. Ramirez had a lot of groupies, a lot of people that uh, thought he was just great. Fame generates attraction. Why were you in the courtroom today? I just wanted to see what he looked like. I think he's cute. It's like the Hollywood syndrome. Yes, there were women that wanted to fuck Richard Ramirez simply because he was famous. While many spectators who attended this preliminary hearing believed all along that Richard Ramirez is guilty, there were groupies, young women dressed in black, who wrote letters to the defendants, wrote poems about him, and blamed society for the trouble Ramirez now faces. There was a clown car of these women, right? In all of my years of covering trials in Los Angeles, I never saw a defendant with more sex appeal than Richard Ramirez. I guess that's just the bad boy syndrome. Gone steroids. He had this kind of animalistic magnetism, charisma, that women found attractive. Well, I'm sorry, but I think they're the dumbest bitches ever. I don't get it. You know, usually you try to stay away from somebody that hurts you or hurts other people, but they want to be right there next to him. Which is mind-boggling. It's bewildering. Because Richard Ramirez wouldn't reciprocate. He'd look at you as dinner. In addition to these horrible, gruesome murders, Ramirez was also accused of uh, some child before the preliminary hearing, Deputy District Attorney Phil Halpin, Sergeant Salerno, and myself went out to the home of the six-year-old surviving victim. And Mommy's holding her hand, and she whispered something in Mommy's ear. And Mommy looked at me and said, she remembers you the best because you remind her of her teddy bear. That was me. She says, and I'll go testify in court if it means keeping him locked up so he can't hurt any other little girls like he hurt me. Richard Ramirez was brought in shackles to his trial, a trial finally beginning three and a half years after his arrest. He is accused of 43 crimes, 13 murders, many counts of robbery and rape and more. Such is his reputation that extra security was set up outside the courtroom and many spectators crowded around for a glimpse of an accused serial killer. The whole thing was a night, I mean, it was, it was, it was a painful experience and it never ended. Maria Hernandez walked to the courtroom. She survived one of the Night Stalker attacks. There was chilling testimony from survivors. A young Pakistani mother told a hushed courtroom. He said, you bitch, you mother, you go going to sleep, otherwise I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill your kids in the crib, and I'm going to kill your son too. 
I said, I swear I won't, I won't scream. I swear upon God. And he slapped me one more time. And he said, swear upon Satan. Swear upon Satan. And I said, yes, I swear upon Satan. I won't scream. I have a cat. Sometimes in the middle of the night, the cat is walking over my head. And I open my eyes, and the cat is staring at me. And I suddenly realize what it would be like to be a mouse or a bird. I pictured what it would be like to be attacked by him, to have him on top. Breaking down in tears, the woman said Richard Ramirez is the gunman who sodomized her eight-year-old son after shooting her husband in the head. It was a scary feeling to be in the same room with him, and you just knew you were in the presence of evil. You could feel it. And I, I think I was there for about 30 minutes, and then it just was too much. And so I had to walk outside of the courtroom just into a hallway, and there was a bench there. And I sat on the bench, and there were some other people that, you know, maybe didn't make it into get a seat in the courtroom, so they were just sitting outside as well. And I was sitting next to this boy, couldn't have been very much older than me, maybe 19, 20. And I remember thinking, like, I wonder why he's here. You know, did he have a family member that was hurt? I remember at some point he kind of lifted up the sleeves of his jacket. And when he turned his hand over, I could see he had a tattoo of a, a pentagram. And then I realized that I was sitting next to somebody who looked up to the person that killed my grandmother. I can still hear her screams of terror during the shooting, then her crying, Mommy, please don't die, please don't die, while I was bleeding uncontrollably in front of her. Your Honor, defense counsel spoke of the quality of mercy demonstrated by my mother's murderer, spoke of Richard Ramirez allowing several of his victims to live. I'd like to talk about the other side of Richard Ramirez's mercy. He beat my mother in the head with a heavy object. The same beating caused my mother to lose blood, blood that my brother and I cleaned up. He then strangled my mother. This is the true nature of the mercy of Richard Ramirez. Thank you, sir. Would the jury in the above entitled action find the defendant, Richard Ramirez, guilty of murder? They started reading the verdicts, and it was guilty after guilty after guilty. Um, 43 counts. Going from a time where people thought I was a young punk trying to make a name for myself to what I believed in and what I had fought for to ultimately get to the point of conviction. And when they read guilty on the first count, then I knew the rest of them were, were in. I became very emotional. I went home that night and I crawled in bed and I started crying like a baby. A judge in Los Angeles today sentenced Richard Ramirez, the so-called night stalker, killer, and rapist, to death in the gas chamber. There was never any doubt that Richard Ramirez would be sentenced to death. So there were no surprises until Ramirez himself chose to speak. I don't need to hear all of society's rationalization. I've heard them all before, and the fact remains that what it is, you don't understand, meaning you are not expected to. You are not capable of I am beyond your experience. I am beyond good and evil. Under California law, this death sentence will be automatically appealed to the state Supreme Court. I appeal this all the territory. I'll see you in Disneyland. That afternoon, Gil and I go over to county jail, and uh, we go up to uh, his cell, and he, uh, he flat asked, he just come right out, and he said, uh, Gil, he said, uh, are you gonna, you gonna go to my execution? And Gil said, I don't know. He says, Frank, what about you? I said, yes, I am. Killer's in custody, killer's dead. No more. Back in 1989, when we had Richard Ramirez en route to San Quentin, he looked back at me, big smile on his face, and it was very, very eerie, very uh, surreal. He said, hey, Falzon, he said, you'd like to know about the two old ladies on Telegraph Hill, wouldn't you? Carl Klotz and I had a previous murder of two elderly ladies in Telegraph Hill. That crime scene was very horrific, and he laughed this very fiendish laugh. He said, it was me. So there's no doubt in my mind he committed other crimes in San Francisco. They say fingerprints have linked Ramirez to the murder of a 79-year-old woman in June of 1984. It's a long time from June to uh, March. It, it's hard to believe that he could contain himself for that long and then go off on a tangent 
uh, for the next four to five months where uh, he goes on a killing spree. So, yeah, I think there's a good chance there may be some other cases out there. Some of the things that I learned from him, it was in his first rodeo that, that one year. I truly believe that there might be a lot more crimes out there that these people never caught. Is there such a thing as bad seed when a baby is born? Is he already a serial killer? Already made or is he created? If you record this conversation, make sure the tapes are destroyed after we're done. I don't want no fucking tapes of my conversation. You're not going to make me out to look bad, are you?